Hello everyone and welcome to the Road by Road Garden Show. This is going to be our first episode in our new studio. But before we go in there to the new studio, I want to show you what we were working with before. So let's take a walk on the wild side here. Go inside our offices here. And this is our old studio, otherwise known as Greg's office. So this is Greg's office area here. And this is where we used to shoot the show. You really couldn't tell it by looking at it, but it's just a small little space here. Uh, this metal sign made, a lot of people thought it was a green screen, but it's just a metal sign with their logo on it. And uh, we had a little platform there and we just set our bar stools up there and shot the bull and talked about gardening. But now we've got a much nicer studio. We can do a lot more things with it. Let me show you that. So, we walk in here to our new office area slash studio. This is where we'll be shooting the show now. Got a camera set up. Greg's in there getting final touches on his uh, makeup done. All right guys, time to wrap it up. We got a show to shoot. And so in this studio here, we've got a nice little table we can do some demonstrations on. Got better lighting in here. Just a little better look. We're not as cramped and Greg can have his office back. So now that you've seen that, it's time to start the show. All right. Back in the saddle. Back in the saddle. Hello again. everybody and welcome to the Row by Row Garden Show. I'm Travis. And I'm Greg. It's really good to have you with us this evening. Uh, we're getting comfortable in our new studio here. This is our first show that we're shooting here. And uh, feels so, like moving in a new house. You got that weird, weird feeling a little it bit. It does. It's going to take a little bit of getting used to. Uh, but we got a lot more room to move around here. A lot more room to do some demonstrations. So that will be nice. Um, Let's talk a little bit about what we got going on right here. We do got a special little segment planned this evening where we're gonna talk about one of our most frequently asked questions, which is what's the differences between your three wheel hoe models? So we're gonna talk about that. Uh, but before we get into that, one of the main things I wanna talk about was these new bottom trays here that we've got in and we sent out an email um, and we talked about these on last week's show. These things have been flying off the shelf so these fit, sit that down over there. These fit our 162 cell seed starting trays. So I've got some beet transplants here that aren't far from going in the ground. So these fit in there perfectly. Uh, so if you're growing indoors, this is gonna be the way to go because you don't have to worry about your um, water dripping all over the carpet or floor or whatever. It's gonna maintain that. Another great uh, use for this if you're growing plants inside, a lot of you I know work during the day and don't have time to water as frequently as, as you might need to overhead water. So you can use this to keep a little bit of water in the bottom and water from uh, wicky way up. Wiki. Now, you don't want to, when you first plant your seeds, you want to do the overhead because it's not going to wick up enough, I don't think, to get those seeds germinated. Once they get going, close to what these were out there or I think they will find. Yeah, that seed start mix takes a, a lot of moisture initially to get it nice and wet. So you want to overhead water at the beginning to make sure you get that entire cell or soil block there uh, wet. I'll tell you another great use for these right here. Mm -hmm. And I'm gonna put one in my house. When you go inside and you pull your boots off right there at the door like you're supposed to do. Right. You can put this as make it a boot, a boot paint. You ain't got the old lady fussing at you by dirtying up the house. Some people around here track worse than other people in, and uh, and they need this kind of stuff. In fact, we probably gonna have to use one here at the office and make some people pull their shoes off when they come in and put them in here. You talking about me? Yes, I am. You well, got some mud grip shoes that just track all over the place. Well, some of those people actually work out in the garden a lot, well, and they get uh, dirt on the shoes more well, than other people. Well, they need to check the shoes, and now we got a place where they can put them when they come in, and they can go in there and go and work barefooted. That's right. I'll tell you another way I'm going to use them is to transport transplants to the garden. So I, almost everything I grow in these trays right here, I can pull right out of them. The exception being 
beets and if I ever grow chard transplants. So uh, what I do in the past is I, uh, I take me a little pen and I poke underneath the holes here. I'll tell you something else as great as a pencil works fine. For a that. pencil. And uh, I'll, I'll poke them from the bottom there and then I can pull all the plants off and I'll put all the plants in a little shallow bucket or something and uh, take them to the garden. But this right here is going to make a nice little transport tray. Carrying tray. Uh, yeah. To take them to the garden. So uh, we've got these on the website. We've got them uh, in five packs and ten packs, just like the trays here. And then also, if you want just one, um, with our seed starting tray, it's we've now got this with our premium seed starting kit, which you get like a dram one. And that's an upgrade seeds. we did just this week. So just this week we added this to the seed starting kit. Right. And we've got more seed starting kits, more indoor seed starting kits coming along. We've really seen a need and a demand for that. Uh, we're working on putting together those. We've been working our butts off in the back getting all this together, but we have got some fantastic kits coming out in the next few weeks. I hope in the next two to three weeks, but before long, we're going to have them out and you're just going to be blown away with some of these new products we got in. Also, I want to talk about this kale I grew. This, now this is lost and out of kale, but a lot of people call it dinosaur kale. And I have grown some that is about as big as a dinosaur. Yes, they are. So these are quite big and uh, I need to harvest these. We'll probably be eating some of these for Thanksgiving. Um, now, do you peel the stem out of them just like we do? With yeah, I do. Okay. I do. I take right. that stem out of there. Um, but we have a lot of people last year uh, with our, our little vegetable bag operation, a lot of people right around Thanksgiving they want plenty of collards, plenty of greens and stuff, and a lot of people were taking and mixing collards and kale together. Yeah. Uh, so we'll be picking a lot of these coming up this weekend. We like kale soup. That's one of our favorite things to eat, and that would, uh, you may have to leave them. Of course, I got some. I cook them on Dang the as pretty as them, though. Ain't close. Ain't close. I stole some of these uh, from your greenhouse earlier. What is it? I don't know what variety of fig this is because you didn't have it labeled. It's no, in a big pot sitting out the greenhouse, but I tried one and they are quite delicious. Really? Yeah. Huh. Now this is what you would call a berry. Mm -hmm. Would you think it's a berry? Yeah, it's got that berry flavor mm -hmm. profile. Now just because it has the red inside doesn't necessarily mean it's got the berry flavor. Most likely it does. The honey flavor ones most of the time have a, a real tan inside to yeah. it. Yeah. These here, you can about eat the whole thing. Yeah, right. Um, we were talking about last week us getting into collecting all these fig varieties. And if you've never tried some of these with the berry flavor profile, it's just completely different. Well, I'm going to make a confession here. I thought when I started my initial research, I stayed on the berry profile because I thought that's one I want. But I have got a tree planted that's a honey profile. Mm -hmm. I don't know the variety of it because I slipped up a time to on my name. I mean, keeping my trees labeled. But now that honey is this is good. It's not a brown turkey, so let's just rule that out. The brown turkeys have a honey profile, but it is a different type of fig that has a, a. It's a dark fig, just like that right there. It's purple on the outside, but it has a honey profile. It's quickly becoming one of my favorites. The other neat thing about having some of these other fig varieties is that. Um, they don't all mature at the same time. Whereas that brown turkey's pretty early, some of these other berry profile varieties are making right now even still. And yeah. so uh, you can extend your harvest and have figs for a lot longer than just that little small window that only one variety might occupy. A lot of people like to eat different type of fruits off the tree, satsumas, apples, whatever yours one may be. Mine is figs. I love to graze the fig trees. Figs is your favorite. Mm -mm. Let's see what else we got going on. So I I didn't get an email, but I don't know if I'm on their email list, but a lot of people are saying that their onions have shipped. Oh, maybe it's me that's on the email oh, list. Oh, you're on the email list. So our onions are, are scheduled to be delivered tomorrow. Tomorrow, okay. So that means this weekend we'll be planting onions. It might rain a little bit Saturday, so uh, Thursday or Friday is going to be a good day to get those in the ground. I've got some onions that I grew from transplants that are already looking real good, but we'll get these in the ground. Yeah, I got a row planted that I growed in my in my beds that I'm I'm trying to see how they do it. But I got a little room left that we're gonna fix 
fill them in with the Dixondale plants. That's right. Um, as far as the videos, uh, we didn't have a, or I didn't do a Wednesday video this week. We had a Tuesday video where we planted some greens. A lot of people been asking, what can I plant now if I'm down in your neck of the woods? And there's, we'll get to that in one of our questions later, but lots of things. And I planted some greens beds on the video we had Tuesday. With this new office, I'm, I'm working on some technical stuff, moving my editing setup and all that. So we didn't have a Wednesday video. And next week, since it's Thanksgiving, we probably won't do any videos. We'll take a break then. And because uh, everybody will be spending time with their family on Thursday night. Nobody want to watch us. Uh, Absolutely. So hang out with your family next Thursday night. We'll take a break from the Road by Road show. Catch up the following week. The last thing I want to mention, and I want to ask you and our viewers if, if they saw this with their shallot planting. So my shallots have all, almost all come up uh, by now, but I did notice that certain varieties were earlier at sprouting than the, the others. So I planted a row of Roderick, which is the banana, and I planted a row of the um, Monique, which is the semi-long, and then two rows of the Ambition, which is the more round. And the Roderick was by far the first. Mm -hmm. And then the Monique was right behind it. And it seems like the ambition takes longer to, to start producing some green. Yeah, Ben's, I got so many onions growing. I just planted one row of one variety. So uh, mine's all pretty much up. But best my memory serves me last year, I did plant all three and they did stage out a little different. Yeah, which is fine. Oh yeah. Uh, as long as they all come up. Elephant garlic's looking real good. Yeah, mine's all looking good. Up. All my onions are looking perfect. And I just put some ammonia sulfate on this week. Have to be a little careful of that stuff. You can't get too much on there, but I think I got it perfect. Got them uh, weeded, got them cleaned out. Man, my onion's looking fine. Good deal, good deal. And there's still time, if you didn't get your elephant garlic yet, there's still time to, <coughs> excuse me, to get on that. We still got a little bit left back there. Uh, so grab yeah, your I elephant garlic. Yeah, I think if you're in zone, I think if you're in zone eight or nine, I think you still get shallots out. Probably could. Yeah. Well, I talked to a guy in Maryland a few weeks ago, and he was still yet playing his elephant garlic. He said he waits, and they don't have no problem. So, yeah. um, still got time to get them elephant garlic, and if you down here in Zone Eight, still get some shallots in the ground. It is still November. I feel like it's been November for a while because I planted onions in October, but uh, still November. Ah, uh, yeah. I don't. I'd have to do a little studying on it, but I'd say if you're in seven, eight, or nine, you can still get shallots out. Six would probably be a little leafy. All right, so this week we wanted to talk about wheel hose, and we're not going to go through a lot of the attachments. Um, we'll save that for another show, but we want to just talk about the main difference between the three models we have. You can go ahead and clear all that out. I'm going to clear all this Okay. Out. We want to talk about the three models we have and why you might choose one or the other. A lot of, a lot of people you know, send us emails or call us and they can't figure out which one they should get. So we want to talk about kind of the main advantages of one versus the other. Uh, we do find a lot of people, once they get one a couple years down the road, they will get them another one. But for that initial purchase, we're going to try to help you figure out which one might be best for you. So let me move my stuff out of the way here. Let's get the single. Let's go ahead and get them all out here. That's a nice new studio. We got some storage back here. Boom, boom, boom. Okay. So, make sure we can, everybody can see all that. Yep. All right. So we got our single wheel hoe, we got our double wheel hoe, and we got our high arch wheel hoe. The single wheel hoe and the double wheel hoe have the exact same toolbar. The only difference between these two guys is these arms are flipped, but it's the same arms, and you've got this longer axle here with an extra wheel. So these, the toolbar on these are identical. This guy is a completely different piece of equipment. So you can convert from double to single, single, to double because almost all the components are the same. You can't convert from either of these to this or this to either of these. This is a completely different unit or beast. Okay, so the single wheel hoe is the very first one we come out with, and this goes back, and this is exact, uh, the exact same thing as the old Planet Junior ones that's been used for 100 years. Now, a wheel hoe 
is a piece of equipment. If you're a home gardener or a small farmer or a backyard gardener and you grow vegetables, a wheel hoe is one of the most important tools you can have out there. But we get people all the time, and it does get confused, and call in and say, which wheel hoe do <coughs> I need to buy? The single wheel hoe is the exact same one that the old Planet Junior that's been around for over 100 years. This baby right here is tried, trued, and tested. It comes with three cultivated seeds on it. Now, if you've got a small garden, this is the one for you. When I say a small garden, I'm talking about a 30 by 40 or a 30 by 50, somewhere in there. If you're beginning garden, I always tell people to go with a single wheel hoe. And these teeth it comes with that we've got on all the, we just put the teeth on there because they stand up easy like that. These teeth can be moved around. You can put them anywhere you want to. You can use one tooth. You can put up to five on there. If some reason you want to do that, you can move these around. Um, so the, the, the single, and I got a video coming on this soon. The, the single has a smaller footprint, obviously, than the double. So if you, I find myself using the single more this time of year when we've got cool weather crops planted. I tend to plant those a little closer together. You're gonna plant lettuce closer than you are squash or corn. And so where I need that kind of narrow footprint, I find myself using the single more this time of year. Example, if you're growing greens intensively, carrots or anything like that, on a six to eight inch to even up to a 12 inch row spacing, a single's gonna come in real handy for that. So let's talk about the advantages of the double over the single, why you might get this guy versus this guy. So with the double, you've got this space here between the wheels, which is gonna allow you to straddle plants when they are small. Okay, from inside to inside, you got four and a little over five eighths. You got four and five eighths inches in there that you got room to <coughs> straddle a row. And you, this clearance right here with this axle is about five and a half inches. Once you put this thing in the ground, it's probably gonna be four or five inches. So when plants are small, you can straddle them. Um, this works well for planting potatoes. So you take those healing plows and cover up your potatoes, whereas you can't do that with this guy because you'd be running over your potatoes. With the single wheel hoe, you have to run down one side of the road, <coughs> turn around and run back the other side. So you gotta make two passes with that, what you could do with one pass with a double wheel hoe. That's right. So, um, and we won't get, get into this a whole lot this week, but our drip tape layer, it won't work with this guy. It will only work with this guy. Every attachment that we've got will work on this baby right here. Yeah. So um, <clears throat> now let's go over to this guy, the high arch, which is, which is a completely different unit. So it's, it's kind of the same concept as this double wheel hoe here in that it's going to allow you to straddle plants. Uh, but we've got a lot taller clearance on here and this wheel spacing is adjustable. Okay, so the clearance on this is right at 15 inches. So we've got 15 inches here versus, I know what that is, that's seven and a half. So you got- What's your wheel spacing right there? Well, now that's, I was gonna talk about, let me give you just, let's go okay. with that because I'm gonna talk about that because we can move that back and forth. So you got double the clearance with this one. Let's see if I can put it here where people can understand. You got double the clearance here than you do here. And this is really important for corn and potatoes too, because we can get the, we can get this out more for potatoes. For corn and potatoes, <coughs> high arc really comes in handy. Now, I've got this particular high arc set all the way in. And what's great about this thing is you can actually move these wheels in or out. Now I've got it set all the way in right now, and we have four and a quarter inches in between them. So basically the same thing you got is here. Yep. But you take these two bolts off up here and you can move this, you can adjust it both ways. Now, if you can, you got two different adjustments on there. Let's just say we want to set it all the way out. Mm -hmm. Then you would move this over two inches and you would move this over two inches. So I'm going to test you, what's two plus two? It ends up being about eight inches apart. On the, a little on bit, the... a little eight and a quarter, <coughs> to be exactly. So you got eight, you can spread this out to eight and a quarter inches here on the width which gives you a huge opening there to go in there. Potatoes, you know, when your potatoes start fanning out and growing over, gives you a lot of room so you can go over there and work those potatoes. So you basically, on the high arch, 
Uh, you got three different settings as far as your wheel space. So you got this innermost position, which is four inches apart. If you went the next bolt over, you'd be six inches apart, and then you could do uh, the farthest apart, you'd get them as eight inches apart. Now, the, the, one of the big differences a lot of people don't understand until they get it with the high arch versus the double. Hold that up right there for me, please, sir. On the, the double and the single, you've got one toolbar. It's all one piece here. On the high arch, you've actually got two toolbars, okay? And the only thing that connects them together is this basically this arch right here. So the reason you'd wanna bring those wheels in, which the wheels are connected to the toolbar, if you want to plow a wider hill or a narrower hill or get closer to plants, there's lots of different possibilities. Well, you there. also have some adjustment on the back here for that too. On your tool board, you got a little bit of just that so you can move your plows back and forth. With this high art, the way we designed this thing, you got a multitude of different configurations you can do there. Right, and so uh, if you want to use the oscillating hoe or the sweeps on here, you bring these wheels or these toolbars to the innermost position and you can bridge that gap there and weed in between your rows. So you don't have to just do straddle weeding with this guy. You can also use it to weed between rows like this one. Correct, now when you buy the high arc, it comes with four of the cultivator teeth. When you buy what we call the double wheel hoe, you get four of the cultivator teeth. And with the single wheel hoe, it comes with three. There again, you can move those around, you can take them off if you just wanna use two or you can put all four on there on, on the double wheel and the uh, high arc, and you can move them around. All of these have the same handles. All of the handles are adjustable as far as the height goes. Uh, with the high arch, there's actually a little more range in the handle adjustment. This guy is the most beefiest one we got. It does weigh a little more than this guy, which weighs a little more. Yeah, than this guy. we got the two bars on, on these babies here is quarter inch steel. The hoop here is quarter inch steel. Now the handle bracket there is three eighths. This, this guy's made out of a lot of metal. And we made this one beefier because if, you've, um, if you're familiar with the old Planet Junior equipment, the old Planet Junior high arch wheel hoe had quite a little bit of wobble in it. It's a good piece of equipment, but it could wobble, especially if you use it a lot over time. So we, we wanted to use some, some thicker steel and kind of get rid of that wobble and have some stability yeah, there. And the way we designed this, what we call the hoop or the arc or whatever, the way we designed it with the two bolt holes down at the bottom and the run of the grain, the way this kind of hoops over there helps stabilize a lot, a lot more than the, the old Planet Junior ones. And I'm a big fan of the old Planet Juniors, but I do think we made some improvements with this one. So let's talk about in which instances I would recommend one or, over the other. Like you said earlier, if you've got a small garden, if you're growing things really intensively, uh, if you're not doing things like potatoes or crops that need healing, your single's gonna be the yeah. way to go. And a lot of people will get the single and then they'll, you can buy that conversion kit down the road and upgrade to a double. The double, if you ever plan to use our wonderful tool that we call the drip tape layer attachment, you're gonna need the double. That's the only attachment it will work with. So if, you, if you're if you using drip tape now, want an easier way to lay it, or you plan on going down that road in the future, you need to go with a double wheel hoe. You can't lay drip tape with this guy because that arch sits right where that drip tape roll wants to go. Yep. The high arch, if you do a lot of potatoes, corn, people heal beans, a lot of crops that, that like healing, like dirt throw to them, this is gonna be the way to go. Um, so it just depends on what you're doing in your garden, what kind of crops you grow, and uh, that will dictate which model will work best yeah, for you. Yeah, so let me, the way I tell people, because we have a lot of people call in all the time asking, so I say if you got a small garden, go with this one. If you get discouraged later on that you bought the single and you wish you got double, no problem, just buy the conversion kit, switch it over. The double wheel here is the most versatile and our best seller here. This is the one I recommend 80% of the time right here. Uh -huh. This one here is just perfect. And there again, you can convert it back to the single wheel if you want to. We have a lot of people that, that think they want to do that, but the reality is you don't do it a lot. Once you buy the single or double, you find yourself not, not, not moving them over. It's possible, but you find yourself not doing it. Now this bad boy here is more for the advanced farmer. Uh, I would not recommend this as for your entry level wheel hoe. 
You know, if you got a big garden and you like the garden a lot, this thing's going to really come in handy and you're going to love it. But it wouldn't necessarily be a primary wheel hood. It'd be like an additional or an add-on. Yeah, the 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 first time gardener, I don't know that they, because there's so many different configurations, so many things possible, I don't know that they would be able to to really get the bang for the buck out of this one yeah. as they would this or this. But yeah. uh, but but you, you fellow that's been growing a while is going to really appreciate this one because of its ability to straddle them taller crops and all the different configurations yes, you can do. If you're serious, this is you want you want to get to add to your repertoire. 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 Wheel hose. All right, so we'll talk about, on another week's show, we'll talk about all the different attachments. Man, we could talk about weeks on attachments. Yeah, you we could do a whole man, we could, whole uh, season of just yeah. talking about attachments. So we'll talk about those on another episode. Uh, just to mention, as you probably already know, all these are made in the USA. They got that stamp on them, and um, most of the metal is, is manufactured by Amish folks, and... Uh, we bring them in here and assemble them and ship them out to you. When you get these guys, when you order one, it really only takes, I'd say, 15 minutes to put it to together. Put it together. Yeah. Yeah. All this toolbar and arms are put together. All you got to do is run the axle through there, put the wheels on, put the teeth on, you know, put the handles on. I was just thinking on. when you mentioned that, all of this, the first two, besides the wheels, were made here in Georgia or stamped here in Georgia. The wheels are made by the Amish, but this hierarchy here, with the exception of these cultivator teeth, is made exclusively by the Amish. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And we have these things powder coated, so they're going to last for a while for you. It's not going to become a rust bucket in just a couple years. So if you have any other questions about the wheel hose, which one you want, maybe you know, if you want to describe your situation and we can provide a recommendation. Do that, put those in the comments. And if you've already got a wheel hoe, we'd love to hear how you use it, how much you like it, um, how much time it saved you in your garden. So give us your testimonials. And if you're still on the fence, uh, we'll be glad to point you in the right direction. Yep. All right, let's get to some questions. Let me scoot this out of the way a little bit here. From, uh, my baby's here. How about that? Okay, I'm gonna set this one down sit here down since there. we got plenty of room. So on the question section, let's talk about that a minute. If somebody sends in a question, we answer it. What we gonna send them? Well, we usually have kind of a grab bag. Sometimes it could be a book. Sometimes it could be a koozie. Sometimes it could be a hat, uh, a garden planner. There's all kind of good prizes we got. So always <clears throat> put your questions in the comment because you got a good chance to win something. Cool, and if we do answer your question on the show, send us an email to cussserve at hostools.com. Just simply say you answer our question. Here's my address. Send us something. We'll get it out that day. All right, so what we got? Tina Patrick asked, is there a way to make carrots last after you harvest them? So I'll tell you, I, I do my carrots after, uh, and I should have brought one of the little baskets in here after I pick my, or I pull my carrots from the ground. And I can usually get two to three weeks out of them in the fridge. So what we do is I'll either pull them with the tops on or I'll pull them and twist off the tops uh, while I'm out there in the garden and just leave the tops there. Just depends on uh, some of our bag customers like tops on, some of them don't, we do it a little differently. Anyway, I put them in a little basket uh, a little crate that's got holes in the bottom of it, and I take it over to my wash station, and I wrench them off. And then- Wrench them off. Wrench them off, you ever heard that before? Yeah. So I wrench them off, and uh, then I let them sit out there and let them naturally kind of dry off. And then I'll take those little plastic grocery sacks like you get at the grocery store in the rolls. If they got tops on them, you can't fit that and the tops in the bag. So I'll just put the carrots, down in the bag, leave the tops hanging out. I'll lay them in the fridge and you can stack them on top of one another and they'll keep for two to three weeks. If the tops are off of them, I'll just put the carrots themselves in the bags. I'll tie a knot at the top of the bag, poke a few holes, and I can get, like I said, two to three weeks. Now, I, I, it would be helpful if I could tell you what my fridge temperature was, but my vegetable storage fridge is actually an old fridge that he used to have. That, the freezer give out on it or something or other. 
And uh, so it don't get real cold, but it keeps things cold enough. And uh, what about what those folks use. up north that have these cellars? They can store their root crops in the cellars. Wouldn't that be nice? Yeah, that is nice. That is nice. I don't you know, know. I would li love to hear what kind of storage you could get out of your carrots if you have the opportunity to, to put them in a cellar. We here in the South, we can't use cellars, but cellars are it great. Gets, it get too hot down there. Not all too hot, but our water seeps into them. So you, you got several reasons we can't have one. The uh, the people up north can store these root crops in these cellars for a long time. So <clears throat> you got any information on that, share it with us. All right, the second question here, and I kind of cherry picked this one because I want you to tell us a little story. Mm -hmm. so speaking of pumpkins, uh, the, well, this guy, Mike Hall, <clears throat> asked, speaking of pumpkins, I was given a huge growing pumpkin seed that I'm going to try this year. Any tips for growing and pruning pumpkins? Now, I, I, when he says huge growing pumpkin seed, I'm assuming he meant he's trying to grow some giant pumpkins. And uh, you've got some experience you can share with us. I'm not exactly sure I should be the one giving tips on growing giant pumpkins, but I can try because I had a colossal failure here about three years ago. I had acquired me some It was giant longer pumpkins. than that. It was when I first started. So it had to be, it was right around 2014. Oh man. It was about five, six years ago. Well, you know how time is. And if you scroll way back in our YouTube archive, we've got a three video series kind of chronicling our, our giant pumpkin. So I ahead. wanted to grow me some giant pumpkins real bad. And I got a hold of me some seed and planted them and the baby to belong. And I, this, I did a little bit of research before I planted them. And this is what I come up with. Especially here in the South, you need to make you something to keep the sun off of them. So I made me some fence posts, like I would put up four fence posts and I got me some old shade cloth on where I got it at. And I just put it around Basically top. a little teepee on A little teepee keeps the sun off of them because it gets hot here in the summertime. And I shaded those plants. Man, I had it working good and, and they just imploded or exploded on me. Mm -hmm. Anyway, let me give you my tips on what I did wrong or maybe it would help you. First of all, definitely have it on drip irrigation. These giant pumpkins are susceptible to too much water. Susceptible, yeah. That was close, though, wasn't it? Yeah. To too much water or not enough water. If you get too much water, they'll blow up. Not enough water, they're not gonna get the size you want them to be. So, tip number one is have more drip irrigation and do a consistent water norm. Tip number two is spoon feed them fertilizer. Don't feed them a lot at one time. You got to give them a little, a long, a long, and a long. If you give them too much fertilizer, they're going to explode. I think that's what happened to mine. Too much water, too much fertilizer will explode. Okay, so the first tip is drip irrigation, cost of water. Second tip is to take them and spoon feed them a little by little with the fertilizer. Tip number two is shade them out. And Tip number three is really what you're down in your powdery mildew. So there's your four tips. Yeah, I think you lost count there. <coughs> one, two. Now, one thing you did with yours is that you, uh, once the pumpkins, once they started putting on pumpkins, you went out there and cherry picked four or five that was gonna be your, your, your big daddy's you was gonna take care of and you got rid of the rest of them. You were trying to devote all the energy in that yes, one pumpkin. Yes, yes, yes. So you would recommend doing that still? I would recommend, that's five. I'd recommend that's doing that too, yep. That's five. All and right. good luck and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a little envious, I wish I could grow a job. Pumpkin. If you do grow some big ones, show, send us a picture on the road by road People up north have a lot easier time than we do here in the south. Although that's not an excuse. All right. Move on. Move on. Number three comes from Ken Collins. He says, now that your fall garden is in full swing, what do you guys continue to direct sow in winter after harvest? I heard you mention kohlrabi, but what else? I don't want to go back to seed trays, just direct seed. So, so. Direct sow. So there, <clears throat> there's a lot of stuff we can, we can grow more this time of year than we can really in the uh, a, a more, I, greater diversity of crops this time of year than we can in the uh, <clears throat> spring and summer. Uh, if you're looking at just direct seeding, that's going to take you out of the broccoli and cauliflower game. So that's going to eliminate some of the things we grow this time of year. But I made a list as far as direct seeding goes. Uh, turnips, which we just planted a bed of all tops. You can do the purple globe or the white hakari turnips we have. Radishes. Uh, a little frost is going to bite them back a little bit, but they, they can usually take it uh, for what we get here. Direct seed radishes, mustard, 
Uh, <clears throat> so you got your curled mustard, your Florida broadleaf, uh, the top soy is a type of mustard. I just planted a bit of that. My Zuna, and we got that premium greens mix. You did some red mustard. I did. My red mustard is wonderful. Uh, I talked about the green mix. Uh, rutabagas, I've been transplanting rutabagas, but I'm good in mind to try direct seed me some. A lot of people do that with uh, yeah. effectiveness. I would just recommend thinning them out to about 8 to 12 inches because uh, some plants get massive. And spinach. Uh, we've had a lot of people asking about growing spinach, and I, I haven't planted spinach in a while, and I, I need to plant me a bed of it. You know, I like spinach. Uh, it's a little bit of a booger to harvest because you got yeah. to get down there and be one with the earth, but um, I need to plant a bed of spinach. And, uh, and spinach is cold tolerant. Very cold tolerant. And we can plant that with a garden cedar, uh, plant a dense bed of oh, it yeah. real quick. Yeah. Some people transplant it. I, I think I would direct seed spinach. I think I would too. You know, for a raised bed, a four before raised bed, that'd be a perfect thing to put in there right now would be spinach. Give you some greens, a little Hey, you could probably have them by Christmas time. Scatter it in there, rake them in. You'd be good to go. Mm -hmm. All right, so I hope everybody enjoyed our first show from the new studio. Let us know in the comments below what you think about the new studio. Do you like it, hate it, or just kind of eh? So yeah. uh, let us know, and uh, we will see you guys the week after Thanksgiving. Hope everybody has a really good Thanksgiving. Sure do. Uh, We've got a lot to be thankful for around here. We truly believe we've got the best customers in the world. We stand by that and we try to take care of them uh, as best we can. So yep. hope everybody has a great Thanksgiving next week and we'll see you after that. Take care.